Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Aquarian Insights. And I'm super, super excited today to bring on Dr. Charles Capril. And Dr. Capril is a board certified dentist in integrative biological dental medicine from the American College of Integrative Medicine and Dentistry. And he's a certified biological dentist from the International Academy of Biological Dentistry and Medicine. Dr. Capril is also the current president of the International Academy of Oral Medicine and Toxicology, which is, in my opinion, the world leaders in science-based biological dentistry. He's also an associate fellow of the American Academy of Implant Dentistry and a fellow of the International College of Oral Implantologists. So Charles, welcome. Thank you for taking the time with me today. Hey, thanks for uh, having me on. It's an honor. Yeah. I, I think to start probably one of the best discussions is really starting to understand for folks sort of the difference between a biological dentist and just sort of a typical dentist and kind of what the main differences are or sort of what you consider the main differences to be? Well, I mean, the traditional dentist, uh, you know, I, I, I was, I mean, I trained yeah. as a traditional dentist and, and as I've gone through my career, you know, I kind of started finding, you know, different avenues and different things that we were you know, looking into and, and kind of directions that, 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 that kind of pulled me you know, down the rabbit hole towards where, where biological dentistry is. I mean, biological dentistry is not a, a subspecialty of dentistry. It's just, it's a way of practicing dentistry. If, if you were to really quantify the difference between a traditional dentist and a biological dentist, I mean, I use the same, the same instruments, the same procedures almost, but we change uh, protocols. Uh, we also change materials. So, you know, you look at the things like the toxic materials that are used in dentistry, like mercury amalgam, uh, you know, there you, you check your composites for things like BPA and bisGMA and fluoride, and you know, so so when you start thinking about the difference between a biological dentist and a and a traditional dentist, I mean, again, I'm still a traditional dentist. I'm doing regular dentistry, but you know, I'm not using fluoride in the office. I don't advocate for fluoride. We look at things like the oral microbiome, which I have to admit, you know, I. I took a class, the, I took a course the other day with some friends of mine, they were talking about saliva analysis. These are traditional dentists. So there are things that are starting to cross over, uh, but we look at things like the oral microbiome. We, we, we look at our materials. We don't want to, you know, in the words of one of my mentors, you know, anything mill or dead should be out of your head. So, mm -hmm. so we don't like using things like, I got to give the credit to D Judson Wall on that one. That's his saying. And, and so, you know, things like root canals, we, we visualize those as, as potential interference fields that are going to block energy flow and, and, and health through the body. So we don't advocate for root canals. If, if, if a root canal is the final option that a patient is just not going to buck on and they still want to lose a tooth, you know, we have some alternatives. I, I don't, I don't do them, but we can refer for, for, you know, certain protocols with certain root, root canal specialists that'll follow ozone and laser and things like that, which isn't ideal, but it's, better, you know, it gives the patient an option. Right. So it's all, it's all about looking at, at toxicity levels, mm -hmm. how the body affects, you know, how, how the teeth affect the body. I mean, the, the, everybody talks about biological dentists or holistic dentists or an integrative dentist or functional dentist it's, it's using so many different names for the same exact thing. It's all yeah. about how the teeth affect the whole. That's what holistic means, which right. I, you know, you always get that kick out. You see a lot of people start to use it. You know, you're seeing a lot of holistic washing out there. And, but, but it's, it's all about how, what we do in here affects the rest of the system from, from, from x-rays, which we have to take, <laughs> but yeah. from x-rays all the way to the materials that we use to the processes that we do, even to the point of the way we do our extractions. Like you, you just can't just take out a tooth and hope it heals because it might not. Because the jawbone is a different type of bone. There's nerves and arteries and veins and stuff in there so you kind of have to really be very careful and ginger when 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 healing from oral surgery because it will not heal the same way and then you can end up with stuff like cavitations or you know what they call fdojs or nicos or or mm -hmm. you know any of that which can become another problem because now you're talking about interference field so in a nutshell traditional versus biological we're looking at our materials we're looking at our processes every day bread and butter very similar yeah. Just not going to use fluoride, not, not going to use mercury and going to keep an eye on the materials. We do bio, biocompatibility testing for the patients that want to know, mm -hmm. you know, it's, and then we bring in certain things like platelet rich fiber and ozone. Ozone's a big, uh, 
the big thing in our practice, lasers. You know, we try to use the technology that we have to make the dentistry better. No, that's perfect. And kind of on the materials question, one of the things I sort of wanted to start with was mercury, because at least for folks that uh, we see in the office, most people at one time in their life have had mercury fillings. And I think one of the biggest surprises to me, so when I moved down here from Canada 10 years ago, in Canada, they had stopped doing mercury amalgams seemingly much earlier than they did in America. And I started mm -hmm. meeting folks that had six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 amalgams with severe health problems. And, you know, we all know mercury is toxic, but they're still being used. And so maybe you can speak a little bit about the role of mercury fillings just in health overall and kind of what is the sort of safe way of getting them out. Yeah. Luckily, like you said, we are in a transitional period mm -hmm. at a worldwide level. The, the UN actually took on a process they call the Minamata Convention, and it's all about minimizing mercury use in the world. And I can tell you that in the last, in the last meeting that they had in Geneva, the African nations set a target for the stopping of the use of mercury. I want to say it's by 2025. The European Union has actually decreed that they're going to stop the use, manufacture, transport, sale of any mercury amalgam related products in the EU by January 1st, 2025. So there is an all out ban in Europe. There's an all out ban in, 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 in Africa. The Philippines has banned it. Uh, Scandinavia has pretty much banned it. The EU right now, their recommendation is very similar to the US, you know, where, where the US kind of came late after the EU established where, okay, we're not going to place it in children under 15. We're not going to do it in pregnant ladies. We're not going to do people that, but so that's where, where the United States sits right now. We don't have a ban in place. We don't have a ban coming, but at least the one thing is that, you know, how they talk about, you know, money talks and uh, consumerism in this country has actually guided us away from, from the use of mercury amalgam because nobody wants black metal fillings in their face. They want something more cosmetic. So like in my 20 years of practice, I've only placed mercury fillings one in my board exams because they made me do it to take my license. Go figure. I think they're still doing that because they, they, it's just proficiency. But that's the last time I've never placed one in private practice. You know, these fillings are what? 55, 50 to 55 percent elemental mercury. They call them silver fillings, right? But there's 29 percent silver in there. So if we go by chemical nomenclature, you're supposed to name it by the material it has the most of. So it should be a mercury amalgam filling, not a silver amount. But, you know, if you say mercury, people are going to kind of balk and be like, well, it's the most toxic element on this planet that's not radioactive. The effects are, are over our systems is what? Neurologic. You know, it, it, its favorite tissue is neurons. And we place it three inches from the, from the brain in the mouth. And it off gases for 40 to 60 years. So it's not that you're getting an incredible dose every day, but you're getting a little micro dose every day, every day, every day, attacking that allostatic load. And once you, once you go over that allostatic load where the body can't, can't auto-regulate itself, you're toast. That's why a lot of people will be like, oh, well, I've got these feelings for 50 years and no problem. Well, it's, it's, it's the drop, the drop, the drop, the drop until it, until it boils over and then you're in trouble. But yeah, cardiovascular issues, thyroid issues, cancer, Lichen planus, uh, the, the, uh, dementia, you know, sleep disorders, periodontal disease. You, know, it, you, you throw all this out there, it's all associated to mercury. And then on top of that, right? Dentists, you know, when, when, when you buy the materials, when you're buying the mercury, you're not sure where it's coming from because the companies are selling it to you. They're buying it from the lowest bidder, right? right. So you don't know what, what alloy you're getting, what mix of materials you're getting. So you might have a filling up here that was done five years ago. You have one here that was done 15 years ago. They're not the same material. Now you bring in galvanism. Because yep. when, when dissimilar metals meet, especially in the presence of something, a conductor like saliva, right? <laughs> now you create electric currents. So not only are you, you're, you've got a toxic material that's off-gassing in the mouth. Now you're affecting the actual energy, comp the, the, the electrical composition of our body. And we have to remember that at the crux of everything, 
you know, not not to sound very Star Warsy here because I am a big Star Wars nerd, but you, you know, Yoda said it best: "Luminous beams are we, not this crude matter. Right. We are energy beams. So, so if we start affecting the energy, and then we'll talk about that later with cavitation stuff or stuff like that. But yeah. if we mess with the energy, and galvanism causes a battery, it throws everything off, and then we go to to your world where it starts throwing things off and 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 right. balance and, and and everything else. So. Yeah, Mercury is a Mercury's a bad boy. I mean, the amalgam filling is an amazing restoration with terrible right. ingredients. Because you could put yeah. it in a wet hole and it would survive, you know, everything. Most of the times when when I'm removing amalgams, the patient, oh, I broke my tooth. Yeah, they break the tooth around it. The filling is perfectly in place. But wow. it's but it's com the comp the comp you know, the composition of it. The mercury is a terrible thing. So, you know, the, the, the trick is, the benefit is in 2016, the IOMT established the, the safe uh, mercury amalgam removal technique. They call it SMART. We've got a website, it's smart, smart.com, uh, thesmartchoice.com, and you can find SMART certified providers on there that will follow the protocols established by the IOMT. They, they were established in 2016. I updated the science as part of my fellow for the IOMT for 2020, and now that needs to be taken Probably we need to do another update. And I think Dr. Uh, Dave Warwick is working on an update to the uh, protocols just to make sure that everything is following the literature. So we do we do actively maintain that, that process and that protocol up to date. And it's all about, like you said, it's all about the science. If it's not in the science, it's not in the protocol. Because there's things that, that we know work, you know? There's things like ionizers that you can have that that throw negative ions above the patient's head while we're doing the removal and traps the mercury, but they haven't been able to prove it with science. So it's kind of a recommendation, but it's not on the list of must have in the protocol. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so yeah, you definitely have to look into, you know, finding a smart certified dentist if you are going to get them removed. Um, it, it's a lot of engineering controls. We're covering the patient, we're using vacuums, dental dam, oxygen, I mean, you should not see the patient when you're working on them. It should just be all the drapes that we have over them, and there's just the tooth through the dental dam so that we avoid exposure to the rest of the body. And that way we can trap the mercury with specialized filters, with specialized everything, so that we don't worry about exposing the patient. But you know what? The patient's only in the chair for that one appointment. You know, their exposure is, is not low, don't get me wrong, but it's just that one time. Now, if you do it multiple times, it's an issue. And you have to take into consideration that our studies showed that when we remove amalgam without any safety protections, our, the, the values of mercury in the air around the patient's head and the body where I'm sitting, where my assistant's sitting, where the patient's sitting, it basically goes above and beyond OSHA standards by about tenfold. You know, OSHA says that if, that if we drop a thermometer in a, in a classroom, we don't use those, those mercury thermometers anymore. But back in the yeah. day, if you dropped a mercury thermometer in a classroom, you had to evacuate the building. Wow. Not the room, the building. That's an OSHA standard. And that's yeah. a 100, 100 micrograms of, of mercury in the air. I can do a removal if I do it without the protocols, without water, without vacuums, with all this. I could be looking at 1,000, 700 to 1,000 above in the area where I'm literally just taking a big whiff. So I'm, a, yeah. I'm, I'm, seven, I'm seven to 10 times more than, the, than what should be an evacuation standard, and it's considered okay. So, so we, have to, we have to make sure that we protect the patient, we protect our staff, we protect ourselves so that we can avoid, you know, all the things that come into play, right? Mercurialism, dementia, mad hatter's disease, which is the same as mercurialism, right? Why, when I got into dentistry, I remember everybody's like, oh, you want to be a dentist? Like, yeah. You know, they have the highest suicide rate. I go, yeah, and I never, I, I, I just thought it was kind of like, oh, well, you know, they get depressed because people are always like, I hate the dentist. I don't like being here, you know? So I, that's what I always thought. But it, what it is, it's Matt Hatter's disease. Yeah. Dentists are the, suffer from the highest levels of cardiovascular problems, right? All of this is related to the amount of mercury that we're literally just taking like it's an exhaust. I remember when I was younger in my career at, the amalgam fillings hit, I've worn glasses since I was 13, hitting me in my glasses. Mm. You know, the little piece of the, the shrapnel just nailing me in the, in the face. So, so you got to be really careful. You know, luckily, thank God, you know, we, we, we're looking at bands all over the place. And one of the coolest things that I just found out through a, 
a colleague of mine uh, in Poland. Poland has actually adapt, adopted the uh, SMART protocol as their recommendation for all dentists that are gonna be removing amalgam. So we're starting to okay. see that, that the process and the protocols are being now taken at the international level because of the science. It shows that, that, that you know, it needs to be done safely you know, if, if you're just going and they're just grabbing a drill and wailing on it and sticking a, a, a suction over the top like we normally do, then it's just not enough. You are being exposed to high level. Like I said, you probably won't feel it immediately, but if if you if your cup has run is over, yeah, you're going to go into a crisis. Yeah. Yeah, and, and to the point of protecting you as the dentist, um, I've had a couple of mentors over the years that were dentists kind of pioneers in amalgam removal in the 80s and 90s when the protection standards weren't there. And later in their life, unfortunately, they suffered the consequences of trying to push through that. So this is a very real thing, not only for the patient, but for all the dentists all over the world. Yeah. Yeah. It's one, it's one of those things that, I mean, my, my mentor in all of this, you know, he passed recently. I mean, I, I don't think it, who knows if it was mercury related? Um, right. It was a skin. It was a skin cancer issue. But we've lost a lot of the guys from you know from the IOMT to a lot of cancer issues. You know, so it, it's kind of one of those you know the the, the pioneers in there. They they've had those issues, and it's just and you know cardiovascular problems. That even even Dr. Palmer, one of the guys that 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 when I started in the academy, that he would do the intro to biological dentistry. You know. He talked about how his turning point was like all of a sudden he went from being healthy to having a, having a heart attack. You know, the heart attack is what, what kind of woke him up. And he's like, wait a minute. He started looking at research and, and realizing the, the, the effect that it could have on, him. you know, for me, that's what got me into this. I mean, I, 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 I grew up in, I grew up in Puerto Rico. I went to dental school in Puerto Rico. I didn't, you know, that's all we did amalgams and, and you know, in dental school, we didn't have assistance. We were cutting teeth dry, you know, because if I cut it with water, I'd be drowning my patient because I didn't have an assistant sitting there with a suction. So I'd be cutting on that, on that amalgam feeling dry, <laughs> you know, no water, just full on, you know, mushroom cloud of mercury dust in my face. And, <laughs> and, and I started realizing that, that, that I noticed something like my grandmother, my grandmother had a lot of amalgam until she was older and she could barely hold a pen. Yeah. And then I started realizing the same thing with me. I started noticing I had a bit of a tremor and that's how I transitioned. It all started with a green dental practice. And then I realized the whole thing with the amalgam separator. And then I fell into the rabbit hole of amalgam. And then I noticed that I had a tremor and I still had amalgam fillings and boom, and boom, and boom, and boom. everything lined up. And, you know, and, and I started off my first IOMT meeting in 2015, came, came back. We, had our amalgam separator in, we started following smart protocols, we eliminated fluoride in the office. And then from there, you know, like, like you mentioned in my intro, I did the integrated biological dental medicine course. And that's actually when the rabbit hole truly, truly opened up, you know, at the, at the minimum, your bio, your holistic or biological integrated dentist, you know, should be doing smart protocols and not using fluoride. That's, that's like, that's base level. That's where I, that's where everybody starts. Yeah. That's what that's what I call the baby the baby biological approach, right? So they're they're kind of starting their way and they're, they're they're going in there. And then you start educating yourself a little bit outside the box. That's when you start going into the root canal issues, the interference fields, the cavitational stuff, the the uh, German biological medicine, homeopathy. <laughs> you right. know, we we were talking about that earlier. You know how you can do things to counteract other things that need to be done, right? Because we need the diagnostics, but how do you, how do you kind of go about one with the other utilizing things like homeopathy and, and, and you know, now I'm, I, I'm even now venturing into the neurotherapy world, you know, which, yeah, which, wonderful. which, which I love. And, you know, from a dental standpoint, I'm not going to medical side, I'm a dentist, right. uh, but, but you can do a lot with it in, in, in the mouth. And so, you know, that's, that's, that's the new avenue. So. No, that's Got fantastic. Here. Kind of, you brought it up a couple of times, it's sort of for me, I think the biggest things with dentistry, obviously the mercury issue, obviously the fluoride issue, but then root canals, sort of a similar conversation I have with folks to the mercury stuff and what you just said, you know, people will say, oh, I've had these fillings for 50 years and I'm okay. Same thing with root canals. People will go get emergency root canals 15, 20 years later. They say, oh, it's not a big deal. Like I can live with it or whatever. 
but talk to me a little bit about why root canals are a problem and sort of how that precipitates illness in folks. Well, well, the thing with, with root canals is I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm not I'm never going to say I'm anti root canal. Okay. I'm not, I'm just not pro. I'm not pro root canal. I won't get one. I won't do one, but, but my, my colleagues in the endodontic world, I mean, they are doing noble work. You know, there's sometimes when, 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 when we see some of these you know, movies that come out and they really vilify the root canal. Again, I'm saying, I, I don't agree with the root canal. You know, I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think it's a good process, but it is there as an availability for those patients that don't want to lose a tooth. Right. Mm -hmm. It's, 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 it's a bandaid. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, it's like wearing a cast on the tooth and it's, it's basically a little bit of taxidermy if you really think about it. Um, it is a way of keeping a tooth in there. It basically becomes a biological implant. I don't mean that in a good way. It becomes yeah. just a tooth that's just sitting there, but it can come with, with several marked ramifications to, to the health because they eventually can become interference fields. You know, so, so again, you know, if you've got root canals, it's really an imperative to kind of check them, take a look at them, you know, do, do all root canals have to come out well i would probably i would if I, I like again if i had one i would think about it right but but everybody's got to make their decision according to where they are in their place and in, in, in this journey and uh, there are things that we can do if you have root canals and you're just not ready to go as extreme as removing the tooth like doing ozone root canal uh, maintenance having them retreated following a more bio i'm not going to say it's a biological root canal that's been used a lot but a more biological protocol which have been established by a, by an endodontist, uh, Dr. Valerie Cantor. She's all about regenerational endo. She's all about moving her practice in the direction of stopping the need for root canal. Even on teeth that a dentist would look at and say, this is hopeless. She's trying processes with laser and ozone and platelet-rich fibrin or PRF, where she's seeing great results, where she's salvaging teeth that should have been root canal. But like she says, that's about 10, 15% of her practice. Right. The rest of her practice is redoing all these failing root canals that 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 were done in the old traditional way. Right? So the American mm -hmm. Academy of Endodontics will tell you, we understand that if we're doing traditional root canal therapy with with just files and material, we understand that we're leaving 30 percent of tissue behind. That's in this is in published literature. This isn't made up. It's in the Journal of Endodontics. And they understand it because they're using round instruments in a ribbon shaped canal. So they know they're going to remove as much as they can, but they're not going to get it all unless, you know, somebody's really following the protocols of very, you know, slow and, and, and methodical irrigation and treatment and this and that. You might get it, but they know that they're leaving tissue behind. And when you leave tissue behind that is dead, that tissue necrosis, right? When tissue dies or, necro or, or, or becomes necrotic, now you've got a, a focus of infection, focus of inflammation, a focus of toxicity you basically have gangrene, right? You've got gangrene, you've got dying tissue that's just sitting there. And this is where I look at it as in, I'm not a fan of root canals because would you leave a gangrenous toe on your foot? Right. You know, you got that back and that big black gangrenous big toe, you're gonna chop that sucker off. So why do we as dentists then say the same thing? I've never removed a root canal tooth that I can look at and say, well, that looked healthy. Mm. When they all, they always come out, they've always got like a grayish black hue to them on the inside that you can see through the through the enamel or through the through the cement, and you kind of sit back and go, hmm, maybe it's a good idea. And that's where I kind of started to change my thought process. I was never a fan of doing root canals, so I would always refer them out. But I started seeing these black teeth coming out, right? And 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 then I started learning, you know, through the integrative, you start talking about how the interference fields happen. Then you bring in traditional Chinese medicine. And the acupuncture meridians and how every tooth sits on an acupuncture meridian. And then I take that to the next level to the neurotherapy side. And it's because why? Our teeth are all connected to what? The trigeminal nerve. Trigeminal nerve is one of the biggest cranial nerves that we have. And it is connected to every single one of our teeth. Actually, you can take it to the next level. And this was a little bit mind blowing for me. Teeth and what they call the dental organ, right? So the dental organ is the tooth the periodontal ligament and the alveolar bone, right? Mm -hmm. So it is an organ. It is a, it is a vital organ. It's got a nerve. It's got a vein. It's got an artery. It's, it's got, and it's got lymphatic tissue. It qualifies as an organ. 
So the dental organ is actually formed from the neuroectoderm, right? When we're developing in the fetus, the neuroectoderm, the ectoderm is also where what? Our central nervous system, our autonomic nervous system, peripheral nervous system forms. So if you really truly think about it, your skin, your teeth, and your nervous system form from the same developmental tissue. They are part of the nervous system. Your tooth is part of your nervous system. So when you have an abscess or you have an, a pain on a tooth and you have a nerve that's inflamed, it's not just the nerve of that tooth. Your whole nervous system is inflamed. And that's the whole premise of neural therapy. You go in with local anesthetics to reset that nerve to basically let it auto-regulate itself. But that, that, that can be a whole other class, you know. But <laughs> your teeth are part of your nervous system. So the moment you start taking the nerve out, you start affecting the nervous system. You start creating interference fields. Those interference fields basically work like dimmer switches on the acupuncture meridian. And if we think about it, 27 of our teeth are attached to our gut. So then that throws our gut off, which, you know, trigeminal nerve is a big nerve, but our gut's innervated by our vagus nerve, which is another huge nerve. Literally it comes down all the way, all the way down right to the gut. And it, it actually interacts with the, with the, with, with the trigeminal nerve. Yeah. So, it, it, so that's the reason why there's so much effective teeth on the body and leaving I don't, you know, mo most of my colleagues will call it a dead tooth. You know, so the studies, I'll, I'll turn around and not call it a dead tooth. I'll call it a zombie tooth. The inside <laughs> of the tooth is dead. The inside of the tooth is dead, right? right. You have to, we, 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 we'll call it spade a spade. The inside of the tooth is dead. And that's what becomes necrotic. And that's what the endodontist or the dentist removes. And then they fill it in with that rubber gutta percha, which, you know, you're in the golf world. Gutta percha was what was originally what? The polyurethane of the inside of golf, of golf balls. Oh, yeah. But it is. It's an antimicrobial rubber that comes from a tree in, in Brazil, and it actually is antimicrobial. And what they do is they fill the canals with that, with the idea of that's going to keep things from growing. But the problem is it doesn't expand, so it doesn't keep things from growing. You can get things in there, right? So when you have that done, when you go through that process, you still have a tooth that has a ligament around it, and that ligament is still alive feeding the tooth. So that's why I call it a zombie tooth. So te you know, technically... Part of the dental organ is still alive. The inside of the tooth is dead. The pulp is dead, but the rest of the dental organ. So you still have a tooth that is still getting fed, but the problem there is the inside is necrosing and dying. And that brings in toxins, gram-negative bacteria, inflammatory cytokines. So now all of a sudden, you know, you you bring in, there's, there's a cytokine called Ramtes or CCL5, which is associated with, with terrible stuff in the body that is in high concentrations where? Around root canal teeth and cavitations. So if, if, if we find it in there, there's a reason for it, then it leaches out to our body. So that's, that's the issue with root canals. You know, you are rolling the dice, you know, it can affect, and like you said, we go to the bucket. Once the bucket runneth over, it could be a problem. You know, it, it, Dr. Weston Price is the guy who started figuring this out and he figured out the correlation between root canal teeth and and the meridians and problems, you know, if you have a, a root canal on, on an upper first or second molar, that is a, that's a pretty gnarly little meridian to be, you know, playing with, All right? That's breast meridian, thyroid meridian, and stomach meridian. So you're affecting breast tissue, which increases the potential for breast cancers and stuff like that. And we do, and I think Weston Price, in, in his research, he said that every time he saw a woman with breast cancer, she had a root canal on that meridian, 90% yeah. of the time. Right, so I'm not going to say it causes breast cancer. We can't say that dentist that what happens in the mouth is the causative root factor, mm -hmm. but it's a problem that goes down the chain, and that's where we have that big issue. Yeah, and with the root canals, you've mentioned cavitations a couple times, and mm -hmm. perhaps explain a little bit sort of what a cavitation is for folks, and then also. Are cavitations always related to root canals, or they can they be a separate entity? So they can be a, they, they can be a set. They're mostly a separate entity. What a cavitation is, it's 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 an area of ill healing bone, right? They have a bunch of different names for it. So the the colloquial term is cavitation. That's the one that and most of your lay folk that's what they call. It. I have a cavitation. Here. Well, we either we call it an FDOJ or a fatty degenerative osteonecrosis of the jaw. We call it, it can be there, you can have one that's called a NICO or a neuralgia inducing cavitation osteonecrosis, or we just call it cavitation osteonecrosis because what it is, it forms a cavity in the bone and it's an area of, of osteonecrosis, of death of the bone. The bone is not 
healed up well enough. There is a lot of fatty degenerative tissue in there. You've got unhealed bone, rontis, CCL5, gram-negative bacteria. I mean, I, I, I did cavitation surgery the other day that I think we even found uh, fungal spores. You know, wow. so, it, so it, it basically, be, it becomes a cesspool, but it's mostly associated with areas of removal of teeth or surgery that does not heal well. Again, like I mentioned earlier, the jawbone is not like the rest of the body. So Dr. Jerry Bucot, who's, who is the, the oral, oral maxillofacial pathologist, he still works up at the University of uh, West Virginia. And he does a lot of the samples. Like if you, if you do a cavitation surgery and you want to get it like relatively, you want the histology of it, you send it to him and he'll check it out for you. Right. He is the guy who coined the term jawbone pathology. You know, he turned around and said, the jawbone is not the same as our long bones. It doesn't heal the same. It doesn't act the same. It is very, very different. So you have to treat it differently. You have to help it heal. You have to help it solidify and core itself. Or you have to at least make sure that when you take a tooth out, you take out all of the ligament, all the infected tissue, so that, and make sure you get it so that the patient follows the post-op instruction. Because a lot of times, you know, this is, this isn't, is, it, it's not surgery related, it's post-op related, right? I, I do a surgery in a patient and, and, you know, traditional way of doing an extraction was what? Take the tooth out, scrape the socket. That's how I was trained in dental school. Make sure you get all the ligament out, let it bleed in, have the patient bite down on gauze, bite down on it for a while so the blood clot forms. Don't spit, don't swallow, no, don't, don't spit, don't swish, don't, don't drink through straws because you don't want to create vacuum in your mouth because the vacuum would pull the clot out. Well, if the clot falls out because you're not following the post-op instructions, you're going to end up with either a dry socket or an infected socket, which basically at that point becomes an area that the body cannot heal by primary intention. And when the body can't heal it by primary, it heals it by secondary intention, which basically creates what? Scar tissue. So a cavitation is just an area, if you call it, you could call it a scar in the bone. It's just an area that doesn't heal very well. And most of the times the body will wall it off the cortical bone will be completely replaced, but you'll have this area of lower density of junk. You know, I, I, I just call it a meat, you know, it becomes like a trash can. So the body's like, all right, we're just going to send everything into there. We got this, this cesspool that we got, nothing. we can't fill it. We can't heal it. So we go in surgically and we, you know, open it up, open up the cortical bone, which is always nice and intact. And then you fall into this hole and you notice when you find there, you find fatty, fat globules that float on the blood. You get soft tissue sometimes. Sometimes you get other stuff. But most of the times it's, you go in there with a curette, which is basically like a surgical spoon. It's not, sh not too sharp or anything like that. And you're basically peeling bone off this, the walls of this hole. You shouldn't be able to scoop out bone. No, not You all. shouldn't be able to. So, so we go in and we can scoop, we scoop out bone. We, we clean it up really, really well. Then we clean it with laser. You clean it with ozone. You gas it with ozone, ozone water and ozone insufflation, which is gas. And then, you know, then you want to get in there and maybe use a little bit of melatonin. Sometimes we put, they'll put direct metronidazole, which is like an, it's an antibiotic, but, but it's got really good anti-inflammatory processes. And it's part of the protocol. You put that in with the PRF, which is platelet-rich fibrin, and you stick it in the, in the socket and the hole that you left behind. Now that platelet-rich fibrin has growth factors, eh, I'm not going to say stem cells, but some stem cells you know, our natural killer cells. And it will basically, it's like putting little foreman and construction people in there, right? A little fraggle rock in there to basically build our, our well, I just dated myself there, you know, to, 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 to construct good bone yeah. instead of, instead of that kind of half-assed repair that they tried, that the body tried to do, but it couldn't complete it because the, the sequence was broken. And that can become an interference field. Again, we go back to that interference field scenario. It blocks the energy through those meridians. Wisdom teeth are, are, are the big culprits most of the times. Why? We don't, and then we're going to get into another topic. We don't develop our jaws like we should in the first yeah. world, right? Yeah. First world problems are what? We have to go to the orthodontist. That's, that's one of the big first world problems because nobody develops their jaw the way they should. Our jaws are, are narrow. We suffer from sleep apnea. We suffer from all these other problems that come into play. We have long, narrow faces, not the nice, strong jaws that everybody likes, right? Mm -hmm. And that leads to 
problems where your teeth don't fit, we should have space for all 32 teeth. We should. If you look at anthropological you know, skulls and, and studies, you see these big wide jaws where all 32, I mean, yeah, they were eating rocks and stones and you know, all this stuff. So the teeth were pretty you know, beat up. Right. They were all there. Right? A friend of mine went to Peru and, and, and she sends me a picture because she saw this really cool mummy that they had that was just entombed for over, I don't know, I don't know many thousands of years. And my reaction to it is, ah, look at that jaw. And she goes, really? I said, well, look <laughs> at it. Because the, you know, the guy's mouth was open. There was all of the teeth, a really wide jaw, all 16, because I've only seen the bottoms, all 16 of the bottoms were there. Yeah. Right? That jaw developed fully. So the wisdom teeth came in. They didn't have to be removed. Today and age, our wisdom teeth are coming in sideways, or they come in like this, or they half stick out. And then you go and you get your four wisdom teeth removed. But you're done. It's all done in one appointment and gets finished in about 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. There, there's no way. I mean, I, oral surgeons are amazing. These guys can pop teeth out like nobody's business. But these patients are not. And then on top of that, they're, they're sedated, which is good for the, for the autonomic nervous system side of it, right, to heal. But then they go home and they're sedated and they're probably, you know, like spitting and doing stuff like that, which creates all these, these, these complications of surgery that lead to cavitation. It, and I'm not saying that every extraction leads to cavitation. I mean, I, I'll, I'll check, you know, I, every new patient that comes in, if I notice the wisdom teeth are out, we'll do a cone beam CT scan. We'll check the density. It's not always all four of them. I'll never subscribe to that theory, you know, but if I see an, if I see an issue of density, then those are areas where, yeah, we've got to work on, on cleaning that up so that we can open up that field because the wisdom teeth, that's a, that's a kind of a gnarly little meridian. That's the cardiovascular system. You know, right. if it's the upper wisdom teeth, now you're talking heart, you're talking pituitary gland. On the bottom, you're talking energy, you know, your energy composition, your psyche, your, your cardiovascular system, right and left, depending on where it is. And then you can go to the, you know, like your planters, all these people suffer from plantar fasciitis, right? A high percentage of those people have cavitation on one of those sides because the planter is affected there. I actually have a cavitation in, my, in 32 because I had it taken out. I had it suture closed and it was cleaned out everything, but I woke up in the middle of the night biting my suture out. <laughs> uh, so it opened up and then it got infected. And I, a couple of years later, started having plantar fasciitis issues. Now I've gotten, gotten it dealt, dealt with, but I even did a little neurotherapy myself one day just to test it. I was having pain in my planters. I was like, this hasn't hurt me for a while, but this was sore. I injected with a little of procaine. 20 minutes later, the pain in my heel, the pain heel went away, never came back. <laughs> right. So then I got, and then I got it fixed and, 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 and you know, cavitation taken care of, and now we should be okay. But there's so many things that, like I said, it's, it's, not, the, it's not the root cause of the problem, but no. it is grossly associated with, you know, what most people do not stretch very well. Right, their Achilles is tight. They don't stretch their foot. If you've got an issue here, the energy flow all the way down to your toe is not as good as as normal. It won't heal it as quickly. You get plantar fasciitis, and it takes a year to clear. That's what happened to me. Yeah. A year to clear the planters, and I was stretching every day, everything, but it would not stop. But again, it was because I had that issue. So it, it's it's again how what happens here affects the whole. Yeah, and, and the I. Mean, I Oh, sorry. I just think that's such an important thing, not only from like an organ function or potential sort of cancerous pathology, but even from a musculoskeletal lens, the innervation of the teeth and sort of the health of the nervous system in the mouth has a direct effect on aches and pains and other issues and joints and other things. I think that's fantastic to bring that up. Well, and the IOMT just completed a, an incredible position paper on, on, on job on pathology. It's things like 30 pages long. They really talk about it and they, they really looked through the research and they hammered it home. And it was, it was so good that every member of the academy that worked on it actually got their fellow. So that's, that's oh, how, right. how, how positive it was for them. And, and, and it's available on the IOMT's website, IOMT.org. You can see the position papers. It, it gives you all the information you need about that. And, you know, if not, you can always do a PubMed, a PubMed search. If you literally put cavitation in PubMed. It's going to be Dr. Lechner all the way down. This man in Germany. He does so many studies on 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 FDOJ and roundtables and all that that it's just there's so much information out there that it's 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 just odd that we're not working on this more. Yeah. And, and so, kind of given these sort of major issues of mm -hmm. amalgams, root canals, cavitations, 
you brought up sort of the physical structure of our jaws and how that's changed in modern times. And I know you got kids. As the mouth is developing, what are some of the things, knowing what you know now, that you encourage to have proper development of the mouth, but then also healthy microbiome in the mouth and kind of all of these things? Like, what does that look like from a prevention side, especially in younger folks who don't have any set pathology yet? Well, We'll start first with growth and then we'll go to micro growth. Growth is, is, is important because you just have to, you just have to follow it. Right. The thing about it is, again, we went back to it being a first world problem, right? So our society, food is very tender, very soft, very processed. We barely have to chew our food, right? You, you want to get your kids chewing. You want, you want those muscles working. You know, we take a child and the child is, is breastfed. He weans off of the breast and then he goes to baby food. In the 1950s, Gerber's came out with the slop that we feed our kids now. So you continue to give your kids soft, mushy, pureed food because we don't want them to choke. And I understand that. I mean, I have kids and we, we had one of those steamers and blenders that my wife used to make all the food and, you know, turn it into baby food. We didn't know better at the time. So your kids are basically at that point now sucking their food down. They're just, you know, slopping and slurping and and then, you know, now everything is convenient and fast. And, you know, we have our go-gurts and the little tubes and, and the applesauce comes in a, in, a, in a tube and they just, they suck. So, I mean, when you're doing that, you're pulling your lips in, your, your cheeks in, right? So it makes your face longer. When your face is longer and your muscles are contracted all the time, your jaws can't expand. If your jaw can't expand the way it should, right? Then the teeth stay narrow. Now the growth is impaired. The face is long and narrow. More than likely it grows downward. It goes down and back instead of out and forward. Now it starts to pinch off the airway. And eventually you start having children that have airway issues. And we see that a lot in kids. If your kids are grinding, snoring, diagnosed with ADHD, still wetting the bed, right? After a certain age, these are all signs and symptoms of what sleep disorder breathing. Right. And that's something to pay mind to, you know, kids should not grind their teeth. If you hear your, te your, your child grinding their teeth, your child is repositioning his jaw forward. It's, it's a natural sympathetic <laughs> reaction of the body to stay alive while it's sleeping yeah. because the jaw drops backwards, pinches off the airway, and then it goes to open up the airway because the jaw moving forward opens up the airway. So it's all about, I, I I don't see many kids in the practice, but when I do mm -hmm. see kids, what we end up doing is I refer them out for evaluation with an orthodontist that is willing to do interceptive therapy. And by interceptive therapy, I mean guiding the growth of their jaw. There's lots of different processes and protocols. You've got Healthy Start, you've got Myobrace, you've got Orthotropics, which is with Dr. John and Mike Mew. They're, they've kind of, you know, they just had a, a documentary on Netflix and they, you know, they, they've kind of been persecuted most of their career because they buck the orthodontic system. And they talk about different ways of doing things. So right. if you've never, if you've never like heard of the muse, look them up. There's a Netflix documentary on them right now. John, I met him at a conference in Slovenia, probably about five years ago. He was 91 at the time. So, you know, he's, he's an older gentleman. He's still around and he's, he's very witty and he's been fighting the, the establishment his whole time about, about, orthodontics. He believes not in orthodontics, but orthotropics. So there are those processes there that you can guide your child's dentition. Don't give your kid a pacifier. You know, if, if you can avoid these really easy bottles that they're able to get the, the, the milk out really easily, that's not going to help your child's growth. Breastfeeding is the, probably the way to go. And you have to breastfeed correctly, right? You have to be able to latch on. The child's supposed to draw most of the, bre most of the breath into the breast into the mouth. And that is the earliest palatal expander because the breast goes into the palate and pushes the palate open, right? And then once they wean off of breastfeeding, then we got to give them food that they actually have to chew. A lot of these, a lot of these developmental pun, uh, pundits are also very big on chewing gum, you know, mm -hmm. sugar-free chewing, chewing gum, right? So xylitol based and all that, but it gets the kids to chew, to do that. There's, there's, there's some devices called like, there, there's one called the Mayo Munchie which is out of a, com a, co a company out of Australia that instead of a pacifier, the kid just kind of, and it just helps to 
to continue to develop the, the, the jaw growth. It's all about if we can get those jaws really, that, 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 that maxilla really wide, the mandible will follow and the growth will go down and out. And if you can guide the children's growth, then you're going to see improvement in overall health, sleep, behavior. ADHD is a sleep disorder, not a, not a behavioral disorder, right? You've got a bunch of kids that are sleepy. And then how you treat them, you give them uppers. That's right. why they get focused. I was an ADD kid, right? When I was growing up, I was an ADD kid. My dad said he was ahead of his time because he gave me Coca-Cola. So I would constantly be drinking Coke. I was uber focused. Whenever I drink caffeine, <laughs> if I if I need if I need to do something, I'll go get myself a, a colada cubana, which is which is you know those yeah, uh, the yeah. four shot of espresso, and I'll be on it, man. I can do it in a presentation in about 10, 15 minutes, but right. because I'm focused. But I have sleep apnea. I have a narrow palate, right? I'm a little bit past the age of being able to treat it, so I got to treat my symptoms now. There are things that I can do. I can probably go see to see my orthodontist. She's trying to. Dr. Yurkovitz is trying to convince me to, to, to get the surgical palatal expander that goes, basically gets inserted into your palate, not on the teeth, but into the bone. And I'm considering it. We'll see. I, I, I sleep with my CPAP every night. I've, I've done night lays and certain things, and it's worked really well. So I'm in a stable point. I get good sleep because that's, you know, but that's what happens. If you don't develop your jaws, you end up like the how many millions of Americans that are going to the airport and pulling out CPAPs at TSA. It's, it's oh, yeah. because it is, it is epidemic, the levels, and it's all about growth. If we would actually allow our children's jaws to grow the way that they should, or if we lived in a society where we still chewed like we did, we still ate our food, we sat down at the table, it wasn't all fast food. But you know what? Society changes. We have to adapt. So that's why we have professionals that can help us with this. Yeah. We can go to the interceptive orthodontics. We can use things like orthotrophics. We can use things like, like myobrace or, or healthy start and help these children kind of move forward. And that helps the growth. And if we can get the growth, it happened with my kids. I started late on my son, but I put a palatal expander in, a expander because he was like, just like me. I looked at him one day, I said, bite down. It was my bite. My kid has exactly my teeth. Like he has the same notches where they go. Wow. And genetics is, is crazy and epigenetic epigenetics is the biggest thing yeah. the epigenetics kicked in and he's got the same bite that i had or had that i had that my dad has that my grandfather had. because we start mouth breathing that's the other thing <laughs> don't even get me started on mouth breathing here <laughs> we have to breathe through our nose people but we but yeah. we mouth breathe so then it, it that affects the growth and that's a lot of other things so nasal breathing sleep hygiene developing you know the, the jaws at a young age we can avoid any problems later on. And that's like the, 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 the shorter, and I know it's not short because I'm long-winded, but the shorter spiel when it comes to that. I'm all about, you know, there's, there's, there's this company called Vivos that, that they work on that. It does interceptive orthodontics. So you can see a Vivos provider. You can see an orthodontist that's willing to do it. You can see somebody who uses myobrace or healthy start or orthotropics. There's a lot of, you know, general dental practitioners that are training in airway now. It's nice to see airways becoming important to dentistry, biologic and allopathic, because we deal with it. But once you get adults, then it's mouth guards and CPAPs. Unless that patient is willing to, you know, the go the way of Mike Trout, the baseball player who had severe sleep apnea and he had the surgery done and they brought yeah. out his jaw. I mean, if you look at him from before and now, you know, the guy's got the strongest jaw you've ever seen. And some people think he looks a little deformed because he looks angry, you know, like that. But now he can breathe. Like he, he did a, a, I was watching the World Series a couple of years and they were talking about his, 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 his journey with sleep apnea. But that can be stopped if you grab a kid early enough. You grab them when they're four or five, six years old. And yes, you're going to invest some money. You're going to have them seeing an orthodontist. They might still need braces because it all depends on the epigenetics that kick in. But the idea is if we grow that jaw correctly, the teeth will fit. If you correct, the criminal is the maxilla yep. and, the, and the victim is the mandible. If that maxilla doesn't go wide enough, then the mandible's got nowhere to go. Unless you're weird like me and then you have a crossbite because I, I, I mouth breathe so much as a kid, I never put my teeth together. My bottom jaw is, is very wide. <laughs> my palate's the one that's a problem. So my tongue has no parking spot and it drops into my airway. Mm -hmm. Our tongues are not oversized people. Our jaws no, are no. undersized. Yeah. So it's all about that. Now, microbiome, you want to talk about? 
just real important, balance your microbiome. You know, that's where fluoride, you know, not using fluoride comes into play, not overkilling. You know, a lot of times we'll, we'll constantly be paying mind to antimicrobial stuff and, and all these things that we want to use to keep our mouth clean, you know, the Listerines of the world and all that. And that's a constant barrage on our oral microbiome. You know, we have three microbiomes as men that we have to worry about, right? So skin, gut, and mouth, women yeah. throw in vaginal, yeah. right? But it's very important to keep these microbiomes happy. They're at that, wherever it's a microbiome heavy scenario, it's 90% bacteria, 10% you, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? And, and they are the ones that are in our stomach. They, they 90, 80% of our serotonin is produced by our microbiome. 80% of our immune system is trained by our microbiome. So without them, we're sick and unhappy. And then right. in the mouth, the same thing happens. If we've got good bacteria, they're going to keep the bad bacteria in check because you can't not have bad bacteria. There, there, there has to be a pathogen. There, there has to be a balance. Like, yep. you, you know, humans, humans have, you know, people that live in free society, people that go to jail. There's bad guys and good guys. It's all about it's all about the balance of the you know the balance of the force, right? And and, and the same thing in the mouth. So I'll talk about you know how to nurture the microbiome, how to keep the pH of the pH neutral. You know, if your pH is acidic, your microbiome is going to be pathogenic, right? You're going to get cavities. You're going to have periodontal disease. If your pH is good, that means nice you know balanced diet that's working for you, not mouth breathing, keeping the mouth nice and moist, not dry. And then we can go to things like prebiotic foods, taking and using an oral dental. I'm going to call it dental because I'll say oral probiotic. And everybody says, well, I take an oral probiotic for my gut. I said, no, no, no. They make them for the mouth. They're lozenges. Yeah. And, and we can actually repopulate the, the, the bacteria of the mouth. And we can use things like xylitol or, or, or you know, colloidal silver or dental cyanin or neem or, or tea tree in our toothpaste. But I'll always tell everybody, do that in the morning. If you're using that toothpaste all day long, then what you're doing is you're assaulting your microbiome all day long, right? Yeah. There are some prebiotic toothpastes that you can look into that you use if you feel like you need to, to have an antimicrobial, because some people just have that feel that they need it, right? right? Use it in the morning, first thing when you wake up, then you take your probiotic around breakfast time or lunch, and then the rest of the day, everything's going to be more on a prebiotic side. And if we can turn that bacteria to the good side, then we're fine. We got mostly good bacteria. And we check that on all our patients. We do microbiological slides on our patients and we look at the saliva on, on a face contrast microscope and I can see what type of bacteria, not which ones they are. I can see the style, the yeah. cocci, the rods and the spirochetes, right? We don't want spirochetes. That means we've got periodontal disease. So we can look at it and then we can tailor a treatment plan and say, okay, we need to balance your microbiome. If you've got a lot of the bad guys, okay, we need to go in and maybe use some ozone to kill the bad guys. Yes, it's a big kill. We're going to kill a lot of people. And then you're going to bring the microbiome back. So it's all about balancing the microbiome. If the microbiome's happy here, the gut will be, and vice versa. Yeah. You're not going to have a good gut if your mouth is bad. And you're not going to have a good mouth if your gut is bad. Because it's opposite ends of the tube. And <laughs> entry, exit. Yeah. So very important. So that it, it's all about development and microbiome. We, we, we can auto, -reg we can auto regulate ourselves. You know, our body's made to heal. Yes. It's, I agree. We just got to help wow. it. Yeah. That's fantastic. It, and kind of thinking about all this stuff, sort of in your experience, kind of what you've witnessed with folks, all the mouth related tooth related things. I agree with you that they're not sort of the direct cause, but they're definitely part of a clinical picture for folks. What have you noticed when stuff like amalgams get removed or root canals get corrected or cavitations get corrected as far as people's health, like when you follow up with them weeks, months later sort of situation? Well, you know, you always, you always notice some sort of, when you ask the patients, because they're the ones that are going to notice the improvement. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've, had, I've had patients while I'm in surgery tell me, oh, I already feel something. Right. I, 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 I had a patient two days ago, you know, we, we, she had a failing root canal with a big ass, with a big abscess on, on an upper tooth. And it was causing her to have uh, sinus issues and pressure and all that. And she basically told me the moment I removed the tooth, the pressure released. Wow. Like she felt it released right then and there. I had another patient, same thing, root canal on front tooth. We removed it. 
and I'm, I'm, I'm over here, not, I'm working on some instruments and the patient gasps. Mm. I freak out because I think something happened. <laughs> Yeah. And I turn around, I turn around, I was like, what happened? And she goes, oh, nothing. I, I can breathe through my right nostril for the first time in 15 years. So sometimes you'll actually see those things that happen immediately. And then other times you'll have the patients that'll tell you, I, I'm feeling better. I have more energy. You know, you see that a lot with amalgam removal. They tell me I'm, I'm not feeling so jittery. I'm not feeling so brain foggy. I'm not feeling so, but, and it takes a while. And then they've got to go through that detox process. And that's when I'll send them to the integrated physician and they might have to go through chelation depending on how they are. And it can take a while, especially the amalgam process can take a lot to, to clear all that, right? I mean, I had my amalgams removed years and years and years ago. And I originally did the, the tri-test, the hair, urine, and, and yeah, blood. Yeah. And it came back like my levels of mercury were negligible. I was like, cool. And I remember my mentor, I remember Dr. Young, he's passed. Maddie, Maddie goes, well, well, Charles, he goes, I, I, I guess you've got a couple of things. You're either very well protected, you're a good excreter, or you're burying that stuff so deep in your cells that it's not showing up anywhere. <laughs> and at the last I, at the last IOMT meeting, I actually had one of those scans where they, where they do the, the, they do the scan and they they basically, what was it? They, they did, if I tell you the name, I'm going to butcher it right now. I can't remember, but it was one of those hand scans, right? Oh, like an oligo scan. An oligo scan. That, that's the I knew I was going to put. So I did an oligo scan and it came back that what? My mercury levels were high. Right. And I sat back and went, well, okay. I mean, you know, I, I, it, it explains a lot because that first test that I did years ago surprised the hell out of me. At that point, I still had amalgam fillings. I had been removing bad, you know, fillings the wrong way for the, the uns, not the wrong way, the not smart way, the, not, the unsafe way. For, 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 for 10 years, I expected to have, especially, I, I remember I told you I had tremors. So I expected those numbers to be up, but they weren't. So, so yeah, you'll notice things like that. I'll, you know, like th that one patient that gasped, she sent me a letter that she said, you can share this with everybody, telling me all the things that the day after. And in her case, what we did with her was we pulled out a failing root canal in the front tooth and we placed an immediate in zirconia implant because she didn't want to walk around with a tooth. And she basically told me, she sent me this letter. She goes, you can broadcast this to everybody. And it, there was like 40 symptoms on there. Wow. And she was, go, she was going, gone, 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 gone. Improving, improving better, blah, blah. And everything was on the positive side for her. She had gotten her energy back. She was really lethargic. She, 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 she couldn't go to work. She wanted to be in bed all the time. She, got, she was just telling me how the energy flow came up. And I see that sometimes. Now I, I've got some patients that that you know I have a patient who has a, a lot of root canals, yeah. And and when we took the the CT scan, not all of them show evidence of any problem. So we've only been working on the ones that are an issue. But then, you know, she's still got the others, and she still has other issues. So, you know, I even I I even I mentioned to her. I said, well, you know what? Because we don't want to do anything just yet because we don't see anything, and you know, it would be a lot. Let's have you see somebody like Brendan. <laughs> I think I referred over to you. And, and, and to do muscle testing, to check, to see how it is. Because, you know, sometimes you'll, you'll get that patient who goes, well, I'm not really feeling 100% better. And I said, well, the body works on body burden. It can only focus on a burden at a time. So you remove one, it goes to the next. And you remove that, and it goes to the next. And you move that. It's all about getting rid of the interference field. And, but it moves on to the next. So you get some patients that it takes longer to heal. Yeah. But overall, most of the times I do hear, especially with cavitation surgery and stuff like that, where they'll tell me I'm feeling better, you know, I've got more energy, the brain fog is clearing up, I don't feel as lethargic, I don't feel issues in that area anymore. Some patients have even told me that 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 the tension in the muscles on that side will actually relax. Mm -hmm. So you do see, I see more positive benefits than than less than positive benefits. You know, there is surgery. Sometimes there's surgical pain that comes with it. And, right. and, and, and there's that inflammatory process that we have to go to, you know, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And then you, you gradually see an, an improvement. But when we're removing interference fields, when we're removing toxic elements, when we're removing things that are, that are causing problems, you, you can only expect improvement. It might take a long time. It might be instant, but you, you see it all the time, you know, you change your diet from junk and, 
from, from junk and Mountain Dew to, <laughs> to, 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 to decent stuff, you're going to feel better, but it might take a while. You know, we've yeah. got to clear it. We got to clear the field. So yeah, yeah. we see improvements. Oh, yeah. That's amazing. And, and it just, again, kind of for me, for anyone who's listening, you know, when we do our evaluations and we do everything, when people come in with chronic sort of recalcitrant health issues, one of the big things is their teeth and mm -hmm. whether it's past surgeries, other things going on, and that's always not the end all and be all for their issues, but it's a big part of their clinical picture. So we send as many people as we can to Charles and whoever can get in to see him. That's sort of what we do. Now, I want to be a little bit respectful of your time here. I don't want to keep you yep. forever. But one question that my wife actually asked me years ago, and I sort of ask everyone now, uh, if you had two minutes to tell the world something that you deem is important as far as health or dentistry or whatever, kind of what would that be? <laughs> Interesting. I'd say, you know, look, look, in, look into yourself, look, look into what you've had done and, 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 you know, what, what is there and do what you can to work on, on fixing the problems that you think might help to alleviate the rest of the system. Yes. Like you said, the teeth, the teeth have a lot of issues and we put a lot of stuff into our teeth. Right. And, 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 you know, Really, really trust yourself, listen to yourself, listen to your body and look for the answers. I mean, don't, don't look for the answers because you don't like the answer you're given, right? Because we get that a lot. Well, I didn't like what they said. I'm going to look for another one until another, until another one. Yeah. But go through the process, go through the testing process, go through everything, you know, leave every stone unturned. Uh, don't leave any, anything unturned. It's got it. You got to look under every box so that you can make a truly informed decision of how that you can help your body heal itself. You know, if, if, if you do it, the body will heal. It, it's our body is made to heal itself. It's, it's yeah. not made. It, it's not made to have to take medicines and deal with the effects, not the side effects because they're all effects. Right. right. So, Correct. so, <laughs> so just, just, and, and, and you know what, do it, do, 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 how do I say this? I always, you put me on the spot here. <laughs> um, <laughs> do everything you can for your kids. Yeah. Right. Start young. Every little thing that you that you can do, especially from a dental side, grow their jaws. Grow their jaws. Take everything as much as you as much as you can. Keep an eye on their diet. Keep an eye on their supplementation. And it's hard because kids are picky. But but as much as you can with your kids. I think I think for me about health. Adults have to kind of deal with the problems that are coming from behind. Yeah. With our kids, we can guide them in the right direction. Guide your kids. Yeah. You know, that, that, that would be my thing. Guide the kids and grow them correctly. And, you know, you know what do they say? Water, water them and they'll grow. So, right. We'll do it that way. Oh, that's perfect. All right, Doc. Where can people find you if they want to kind of look you up, see what you do? What's the best way to get in contact with you? Well, I, I always direct most people to the website because the website yep. has a lot of information. And, you know, so www.orlandoteeth.com. There's a okay. lot of information on there. The tooth meridian charts are on there. So you can even look and kind of do a self-assessment. You know, the teeth number where you have the problems, you can do that. Phone number is 407-601-7999. We're in Southeast Orlando. We're close to the airport over towards the Levis Lake Known area, if you know anything about Orlando. But I'm about seven minutes from Orlando International, so it's 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 Perfect. pretty it's pretty easy to get to. But the website is so much information, and you can get the numbers and the emails, and you know the, the the team members. If you have any questions, we'll try to answer as much as you can, and if not, I'll try to help out. And that's where we are. Thank you so much for your time, Doctor. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Brandon.